All right. Oh, cloud recording. Red lights on. Got people in a waiting room. All right. Let's look. Should we meet. admit Doug Rogers? I'm not sure about him. All right. Well, why don't we get started? Sean can do the intro and then we'll hand it off to Jeff and as others join, I will admit them. Sounds good. All right. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to the fourth anniversary edition of Product Tank Pittsburgh. We just learned recently. Uh, so glad you can join us in, in these uncertain times. So uh, if you're familiar with Product Tank, uh, or if you're not, either way, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to give you about a five-minute update of what Product Tank is and mind the product, um, this, uh, this thing that Nate and I have done for a few years now, and then I'll turn it over to Jeff. So just be real quick about this. Uh, for those not familiar with Product Tank, it's a uh, it's it's sort of the uh, uh, meetup slash nonprofit ish arm of Mind the Product, which is a London based organization. They got started about ten years ago, just organizing you know product people meetups. Um, dipped in to see lately how many there are. There's over two hundred Product Tanks now worldwide, of course, including ours. There's tens of thousands of members out there. I, I stole this off their website a little bit earlier, so. Unless you are into organizing product tank Antarctica, looks like you're pretty much covered in all the continents. So a lot of product tanks going on again. We're, uh, we're happy to have been part of it for some time. Uh, so what is this thing? Just uh, again, a regular series of meetups that we do uh, run by product managers and for product managers. But as, as you know, who work in the product world, that is a wide definition. That could include product management as a pure play, could include marketing as we're talking about today, could include uh, technology teams, designers, UX people, that whole universe of product is really the intended audience for, for these sorts of meetups. And as you see here, we just set up uh, a get together. We used to do it live and now nothing's live. So we're going to do it on Zoom. Uh, we're not going to sell you anything. We ask that you not sell anything, at least in the meetings. Uh, but this is really to get you know the, the, the product uh, folks in Pittsburgh and beyond, I guess, now together and just talking. It can be a lonely business um, when you stand in the middle of all of these groups and don't really talk to, to similar folks and peers in the space. Uh, there is a lot of resources. They're unfortunately a little less free than they used to be, but there are some resources available um, as, as part of Mind the Product and Product Tank uh, for you to use, should you be interested in, in looking at a little bit more. And I'll just go through these slides just to show you what those are. Uh, there is a Slack. I get a lot of Slack in my day, so I don't tend to use it all that much, but there's a lot of conversation that happens there. Often it's still... Uh, live and lively. So if you'd ever want to join that, there's a lot of product folks worldwide to talk to there. Uh, they do a blog regularly. And we've seen, you know, folks that do, write things in that may be of interest to them to publish on their website. Like I said, there's tens of thousands of folks that are kind of uh, affiliated with product tanks members. So I think there's a pretty wide reach with this. So if you want to take a crack at some of the, you know, some thought leadership, uh, you're always welcome to mail articles or ideas to mind the product. Uh, my favorite bit, which is, is unfortunately, I believe, behind a paywall now, but the Mind the Product weekly newsletter, I think, is great. It's a really well curated uh, chunk of product news and product related news. So I'm, I'm a big fan of getting that. I believe now there is a uh, smallish membership fee uh, on their site to get access to stuff like this. Or maybe, maybe you get, a, I think they, they might do a freemium model where you get some and, you know, might need to pay for some more. But I think that's a very valuable thing. Another valuable thing is their job board, especially now uh, in this era with a lot of jobs, more jobs than ever going remote. So you'll see a lot of product and product related jobs posted on this site. Uh, if you're searching, it's a good place to be. Uh, if you have a job that you need to fill, it's a good place to be. And you can also, uh, and we, we've made a few love connections, I think over the years with local jobs. So if you have a product job, product related job you'd like to advertise, let us know either Nate or me, I've got a slide up uh, in a few that tells you how to do that. They do a lot of conferences. I've updated this slide because of course they've all been canceled. Uh, these are actually great, the, the Mind the Product conferences. They bring in a lot of uh, sort of top tier talent from the product world. They do several. Uh, I've been to the San Francisco one a few times and Nate has too. But I happen to look on the site today. If you have time and a few bucks, I know they're doing a virtual uh, conference starting tomorrow going in through Thursday. Something to look at, but uh, one of the one of the tips that uh, I'd offer there is, you know, there's a lot of collaboration you might miss out by not attending the conference, but they do tend to post the speakers uh, on the website after an amount of time. And those are great videos, by the way. If you check out, I think it's just mindtheproduct.com. Um, there's just some good gleanings from all of these all these product leaders that talk at the conferences over the last few years. So I'm Sean. 
the guy over there in your Zoom window is Nate. Um, introduce ourselves a little bit. We've been doing this, as I said, for four years now, which is pretty cool. Um, we are product guys. We, we actually work for the same company, a uh, startup in Boston called Hospital IQ. We've been doing this for a little while. Um, we are big fans of, of what you might call the modern style of product management. You know, uh, the world's a little bit different than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And one of the best ways we believe to learn about product management is to talk about people who do it, regardless of, you know, level of experience. Everyone's got an interesting story and an interesting backstory in product for that matter. Um, we have a lot of opinions about that, but we're going to spare you those today. How to find us. So a few links here. Um, I added one here on YouTube as we were talking about a minute ago. So of course we have a meetup page. Uh, those of you who use meetup a lot, it's not the best thing in the world, but we've got about a thousand members on that. So there's a pretty decent size reach for those, you know, that's definitely the place to sign up if you're not already on there uh, to get, you know, updates for, for new meetups. Uh, I'm a little bit more of a fan of our LinkedIn group though. It's just producttankpittsburgh.com. It redirects to, to LinkedIn. It's a couple hundred members on there. And I think that's a little, a little tighter space if you have questions to ask or, or things to pose the group, or again, you know, jobs that you may need to post. We've had, we've had members do that in the recent past. So, you know, check that out, bookmark it. Um, just a, a, a nice space for a couple hundred product folks in town to gather. And then lastly, we started as of this sort of Zoom era, putting up the um, meetings on YouTube. I think there's one so far. Uh, we can't customize the YouTube URL yet. So that's why that giant pile is on the slide. But uh, you're welcome to, to search us on YouTube and you can find uh, the videos there. Shout out to Carnegie Mellon and Nate's Vest. Uh, we've been sponsored by the Master of Science and Product Management program, of course. Doesn't get us a whole lot of pizza or uh, venues in this era, but but thanks to them for being uh, such a good resource now and in the past. So I'll stop talking. Uh, our guest tonight is Jeff Lizick. He's president and CEO of Redshift Digital Marketing, and he's here to talk about uh, the convergence of digital marketing and product management, which I think is a really interesting topic. So Jeff, take it away. I'll stop the share. All right, Sean, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, unlike Sean and Nathan, um, am not extremely well-versed in product management, but I'm going to try my best. I am the marketing guy, and let's see, I can share my screen here. There we go. I think you guys can see that. You guys see that? Yep, got it. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'll give you a quick agenda of what we're going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, and I think that's part of what um, prompted Nathan to invite me to talk to you guys is I, I have a very diverse background, as you'll see. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my background. I'll talk a little bit about the basics of digital marketing. Uh, I like to talk about the things that a lot of people tend to forget. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about product management and marketing and how the two come together. So let's get started. All right. All right, so what qualifies me to be up here speaking today? I started my career with Kimberly Clark Corporation. I ended up being a category manager for the Northeast and North Central regions. I had Kleenex, Huggies. Um, I was there during the acquisition of Scott Towels and we had to do the merger of the Kleenex, the Kleenex and Cottonelle brands. Um, so when I was at Kimberly Clark, I ended up being recruited by AC Nielsen. And I went to AC Nielsen and I ran the Heinz Frozen Food Market Research Team. So I had Arita, Smart Ones, um, Bagel Bites. Uh, what else we had? Uh, oh, who? It was a, fa a, fa a fast food place that launched their own brand. I can't even remember what it was. It used to be one right on McKnight Road, Boston Market. Um, we had the Boston Market line of products. So that, that was a lot of fun. Um, after leaving AC Nielsen, I completely by accident started my own multi-million dollar e-commerce business. Um, my claim to fame in the e-commerce space is I started with $6,000 cash in January and by December I had sold 4 million online. Um, I ended up exiting that business after about three years, uh, sold that to my top supplier. I was one of the first three people to actually beta Amazon's open marketplace. So now anybody in the world can sell on Amazon. Uh, I was one of the first three companies invited to actually sell on Amazon. Part of that was because I was consulting eBay on how to 
segment their categories and help make a better shopping experience um, for the eBay user. Uh, that came about because when I was at Kimberly Clark, I had a counterpart at Procter and Gamble who ended up becoming the director of sporting goods over at eBay. Uh, and he invited me in to help him structure that court category and that uh, shopping experience. So after I exited that business, um, I went, I, I thought, you know what, these, this employee thing is ridiculous. Payrolls, ridiculous. Um, having to manage people, I'm going to go back to corporate America and get a check. So I went to American Textile Company as director of sales operations. And after my first week, I said, this corporate America thing is ridiculous. I hate having to deal with these people. I hate having a boss. I need to go do my own thing. So eventually ended up leaving American Textile Company and I started my own agency. I started something back at, I think, 2009. It was peak internet marketing. After nine months of running peak internet marketing, I got an offer from a business consulting firm to merge my business with theirs and bring all my clients over and start um, start their entire marketing division. Well, after five years, I came to find out that I was generating 90% of the revenue for a business consulting firm. And it was we were now a marketing agency. So I tried to acquire that business and that we couldn't work that out. So eventually I acquired um, Zbrand and Zbrand had been around for I think nine or 10 years when I acquired it. I've now owned it for over three years. Uh, we rebranded as Redshift. Um, I'll give you a real quick um, lesson. A cosmological Redshift is when a universe is expanding or growing and we help clients' businesses expand and grow. So that's where the, the idea of Redshift came about. So it actually has a tie to what we do for clients. Um, up until this point, everything I had been doing in the digital marketing space was working. Um, but we had client retention, we had great client results. Um, we were firing on all cylinders, but I had to wrap my head around why, why were we getting results that seemed to be atypical in the space. And as I thought about the why, I started to think about what are the difference makers? Um, I don't know if anybody's been to our website, we're updating it, but we talked about being the anti-agency. That's because I don't like a lot of agencies. I'm, I'm, I'm Actually, I don't like many agencies at all. I was on the client side for several years and I thought that there was a better way to service the client. First thing would have been clarity of communication. I always hated surprises, but I always got one pretty much every single month when my bill arrived from the agency I was working with. Um, the other thing was relentless accountability. I always felt like the agencies were not accountable for the results. Um, and now we live in a day and age where we, sh we should be owning part of the results. And we actually build that into our business model with all of our clients we actually own part of their annual business objectives and we are accountable for those business objectives. Uh, some of those are dollar based, some of those are lead gen based, but we, ha we have uh, accountability and that, that's hard to come by uh, in the agency space. And then the last thing was unwavering service. We're not gonna nickel and dime people. If somebody needs something done and it can take an hour or less, we're, we're gonna take care of it. Um, we work on a points-based system and not the hourly billing system. Uh, anyone in the software space is familiar with the points-based system, but it actually gives us a lot of flexibility, a lot of agility uh, in, in changing course and not having to go through red tape of pricing things and having new proposals, et cetera. So once I thought about what were the things that we did best, uh, I created this whole system called digital marketing essentialism. Digital marketing essentialism is only working on matters or only working on what matters, nailing the essentials. And at the end of the day, it's getting the right things done and doing the right things better. It's all about getting back to the basics. And part of it is about the, the entire Pareto principle. It's, all, it's that 80-20 rule. What's the 20% that we should be doing 
that are going to give us 80% of our results. When it comes to um, the marketing space in general, we see a lot of, you know, what, what's the new thing this week? Or uh, a, a business owner says, I had coffee with my buddy on Monday. They're killing it on AdWords. I had my secretary put together AdWords campaigns and we lost $30,000 in the first month. It doesn't work. Well, oh, no kidding. <laughs> so we have a lot of these silver bullets. Um, everybody is interested in the sprint. They're not interested in the marathon. And what I ended up coming up with was the original concept. I'd called it a foundational marketing pyramid, but it is literally taking all of the basics of marketing. Actually, we have the foundational components of digital marketing that all businesses need in order to find success online. And what it looks like is if you stack all of these things on top of each other and you pay attention to all the little details, you are going to have exponential success. Um, we have to know our consumer inside out. Knowing the consumer also means understanding our competitive landscape. You're going to see a little bit down the road where working with the Bagel Bites brand, I'm going to talk about how not understanding the competitive landscape almost sunk that brand. Um, and it, 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 that, that played a big role in some of the changes in that entire category. But once we know the consumer, we have to know all the consumer's options. And nowadays we have more data than you can imagine about the consumer and what their habits are and what they're doing. I don't know how many of you um, know about retargeting and the Facebook pixels on websites, but almost every consumer site in the world has a Facebook pixel. So that means if you go to Best Buy and you shop for 12 items, and then you go to Nordstrom, and then you go to Finish Line, Facebook actually has all of that data. They know what you looked for. They know all of your interests. They know if you're buying for people as gifts or if you're buying for yourself. It is, it's amazing the, the, the breadth and depth of data that Facebook and Google have about our end consumers. So using those tools, understanding that consumer inside out. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can put a Facebook pixel on your website and it will record everybody that's visiting your website, compile their profiles, and then you go look at the demographics of who's been visiting your website and what they look like. You can do it on Google Analytics. Facebook gives you a little more detail than you find in Google Analytics. But just running that pixel and having it out there is compiling consumer information. And with startups, it, it, it's critical. Um, to, to start to understand as we're building the brand and, and we're, we're getting products out to market and we're talking about products, it's critical to know if the right people are hearing our message and if we're getting in front of the right people. And these little um, data sets or, or giant data sets help us answer those questions. Um, once we know the consumer and we know the competitive set, we have to have a, an optimized platform. And having an optimized platform isn't just your website. Your website is the number one asset you have online and it has to be optimized. But you also have all the other channels you speak from. And that might be, that might be Twitter, that might be LinkedIn, it might be Facebook or Instagram, but you wanna make sure that you are talking from an optimized platform. And a, a good example of this is we had a client that was running um, Google ads uh, they were working with another agency and they came over to us about 10 months ago. Um, they were spending about $20,000 a month on Google ads, but they were send, sending all the traffic to A, their homepage, but B, it took 12 seconds to load. So their platform wasn't optimized. They can say that in an entire year, they never got one lead from all of those ads, which is crazy. But their platform wasn't optimized. Literally, I went, I ran a quick analysis. I told them they needed to move off of GoDaddy and go to a different host. And they cut their load time to under 6%, all because of where they were hosting their website. But it's a great example of a brand that threw away a quarter of a million dollars because their platform wasn't optimized. And nobody at the company knew that that was an issue. 
they knew their site was slow and they couldn't figure out why their CIO couldn't figure it out. Well, CIO is worried about all of the technology and they're a SaaS based business. So that CIO isn't worried about or, or knowledgeable on the website side of things. Um, so once you have that platform and you have your platform optimized, you have to have targeted content and it has to be contextually relevant content that's talking to that consumer that we already know inside out. Once we have that content on the website and all of the content needs to be data driven, um, it, it has to have the voice of the brand, but also what we're talking about, there is a lot of information out there. There's a lot of software tools that tell us what we need to be talking about um, to reach our target consumer and our own, our own market research, et cetera. But once we have that content, we need to distribute that content, syndicate it, promote it. And then we have people coming in that we start working on getting people into the top of our funnel. But it's all of these little basics that people forget about. So there's a lot of people that you ask them if they have a, an email list. No, they don't. Well, the best product launches are products that launch with giant email lists already compiled because the team has been working on building email lists since the product concept was came to be. Um, and a lot of people do that with landing pages. You can do that with ads. Uh, there's actually even a lot of testing that we do for messaging and for products that don't exist yet that we'll run Google ads and we test the messaging to see, is this gonna resonate with people? Or we have an idea or a client has an idea for a product. They wanna go to market with it. They think it's the greatest thing in the world because everyone that creates a product thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. They have some feedback, but we can go to the masses with a Google ad campaign that goes, all I wanna know is, is my message or my pain point going to resonate? And am I going to get that click? And if the words and the message gets the click, they can go to a landing page that says coming soon, sign up to stay, to be notified, just like you would with a Kickstarter or any, 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 any of these other um, platforms out there that help you get a product off the ground. We can do something very similar through AdWords, through Facebook ads, et cetera. Um, Anyways, I'm getting a little bit of a, head of a little ahead of myself. So anyways, the message in summary is less, do less, but do it better. Never forget about the basics of marketing. Um, make sure that the brand is investing in the right activities. That, that is key. I've seen so many people throw money down the wrong rabbit hole, and then they don't have the money to do something that they should have been doing. Um, because there's more activities than there's time and money to invest in. So it, it's about being disciplined. It's about having a very systematic approach. Um, so that's the, that's digital marketing essentialism in a nutshell. Uh, then we're going to get a little bit into product management meets digital marketing. Um, so we have two types of product managers. And why does that matter? Well, we have your customer facing product manager. And these guys are collecting feedback from users. They're analyzing data from the website or from their application. They're coming up with new ideas and features. And they're working with engineering. They're working with the, the user experience team. Um, a, a, a great example of this is, and Sean and I were talking about this earlier, we have a client, A-Liner. They manufacture A-frame campers. And we're talking today about they, are, they have such a backlog that our 2021 marketing plan is all geared toward, having, geared toward having the best 2022 we can have. So we're spending 2021 preparing for 2022. And one of the things we're going to be doing is using Instagram to understand what upgrades and features people want in their A-line or camper. So we're gonna roll out new products for 2022 those will be um, launched or, or at least broadcast in July. We're going to spend the first six months of the year running polls to a very targeted audience, but, uh, but they, they are made up, that brand has a ton of raving fans. It's unreal how these campers um, 
latch on to this brand. I mean, the brand in the RV space is like Kleenexes in the facial tissue space. People are, are out looking for an A-liner and they just mean an A-frame camper, but they're calling it an A-liner. Um, but we're using that digital marketing piece of it to understand product features that the consumer wants. And we can do it with Instagram stories. We literally can do it where it's not costing us to run ads to even test that piece of it. Um, so that's about, that's the customer facing product manager. Then we get into the technical product manager. And this is typically your, your SaaS based business or your applications um, working on development where you have a lot of deeper technical knowledge, um, not usually customer facing, um, especially if the product manager is a developer. Uh, the, I know there's no offense to any developers out there, but I know developers don't like to talk to a lot of people. Um, in the marketing world, we talk about developers and engineers kind of in the same light. Uh, so, um, but this, this is where people are, they're, they're looking, they're more into the back end systems. Um, my biggest struggle here has always been what the product manager has as a vision. And a lot of times it's the founder of the company, but it doesn't necessarily align with what the end user wants or finds valuable. And there are a lot of companies that get off the ground and build out a product that they think is the, the greatest thing in the world. And they're just not getting traction. And a lot of times they blame the marketing team, but there are tools out there. I don't know if you guys have heard of usertesting.com or hotjar.com, literally, we can hire for pennies on the dollar people to go and test either a website, an application, or read about a product and give us their feedback as to is it, does it meet their needs? Doesn't it meet their needs? What's going through their head? What are they thinking? Hotjar records um, how users navigate through a website. So I have, um, uh, I'm a mentor with Project Olympus over at CMU. And a lot of times, one of the first things I say is, guys, put a hot jar on the website. You get 300 screen recordings for free. Let's see what people are doing when they get to the website. It doesn't matter if it's a physical product or if it's an application. We can look and see what people are doing and where they're falling off and where we're losing them. And it all helps guide us as to what we need to be doing from a product perspective. Um, so that's the, the technical piece. Um, Nathan, how much time do I have? Because I could go as fast or slow as... Um, I'd say about to like seven. Oh, okay. And that includes Q&A, right? Uh, sure. For okay, all right. Um, it's pretty loose. Okay, all right. All right. So nonetheless, we have these two different types of product managers, but they both have to have a strong relationship with marketing. Um, the product manager we know is accountable for all aspects of the product life cycle from, from the vision to the end consumer and beyond marketing in 2020 and 20 and, and, and moving forward is a plethora of data and information that we traditionally did not have at our disposal. And it's. You, you can't just be a product manager today. You have to be a collaborator you, and you are the best possible collaborator. If you are a product manager within a business, whether you're an employee or the founder, you understand that product and all of the moving parts better than anybody. And your collaboration is absolutely critical. I can't tell you how many times I worked with a, a SaaS based startup or an app startup that changed the roadmap for the product, but didn't tell marketing. That, that's usually pretty critical, um, especially when the roadmap changed because of somebody's opinion, but it wasn't based on the market. And I've actually, I, I still see that sometimes today. Um, so then we get into the product marketing role. Uh, I, I think everyone here understands what that is, very strategic work, um, positioning, messaging, understanding the buyer and market dynamics, 
Um, it's not necessarily just the the day to day execution of things. Uh, it's enabling the sales team, which is is critical. Um, I have a, a couple myths here about uh, product management and product marketing that I want to talk about real quick. Product management is inbound. Product marketing is outbound. I can agree that these positions can be more inward facing and ones more outward facing, but the best product managers are the ones that are engaged with marketing and helping to drive the message to the consumer and the end user. I Let's see, I actually have a great example coming up. The other one is product management listens to the market and product marketing speaks to the market. Well, nowadays, given social media, the, the marketing team is probably doing most of the listening. And the marketing team is the one that's engaged in social media. And there are great listening tools out there to, to understand what the market wants. And I think everyone needs to be listening to the market. You can never make any assumptions and you can't afford to let any one detail go unnoticed. Um, and I know Nate likes these two stories, but this is where we're gonna talk a little bit about Bagel Bites and Kleenex Cottonell Fresh. So Bagel Bites, we were at a point in time where the brand started to tank and lose market share literally overnight. It started, it fell off a cliff. And I actually figured out why. And it took quite a while for me to compile all the data and get the information and prove what the purpose or what the reason was be as to why we were falling off. And it ended up being that there was a frozen taquito product line that had launched an 80 count pack. And we had an 18 count pack and we did not have a bulk product. And the bulk product, this was just right at the turn of when bulk products really started to take off. Well, between the entire brand team and the marketing team, none of us were out in the stores watching to see what happened. And I will say like when I was at Kimberly Clark, I would sit in the stores for eight hours. I would watch how people shopped. I, I completely understood how we used pricing to manipulate what people bought and how margins were spread across the category. Giant Eagle does a phenomenal job of it. Um, I mean, a lot of people are like, Giant Eagle is so expensive. They'll go to Walmart, but they might end up spending more at Walmart than they do at Giant Eagle, all because of how it's positioned and how the lost leaders are positioned and what products are discounted by how much. And a, a nickel here and there makes a giant difference. Um, but we weren't out in the in the stores, we weren't watching the consumers, and we missed it. The fact that the, the consumer was changing. And a lot of brands count on the sales team to be the ones that are out in the stores. Well, I, I shopped all the time. I don't now, because we're in COVID. But, but there were a lot of people that could have been stopping and watching and understanding what that consumer mindset was like and we missed it. And the brand, that was very critical. It, it could have, we could have lost the brand at that point in time. Um, another one is the Kleenex Cottonelle Fresh. This was a $250 million mistake. So we had all the data in the world that consumers more than anything wanted a wet toilet tissue. I mean, it's amazing the number of people that run their toilet tissue under the faucet. Like it is unreal, the data. And I love how they positioned it as moist toilet paper. I was like, that's the worst thing we could ever say. Um, but the data was overwhelming. The consumer wanted wet toilet tissue. So we launched wet toilet tissue. Walmart bought hundreds of truckloads. Giant Eagle had a giant display in every store. Yeah, Kmart went buck wild. It was insane. Well, if you see this package and you see right here is the, the rolls, but see this plastic thing right here? This plastic thing was an attachment that had to attach to the top of your toilet paper roll. Well, nobody 
talk to any consumers ever about, well, do you want wet toilet paper bad enough that you'll disassemble your toilet paper holder and you'll attach this plastic piece to it that's gonna hold the wet toilet paper and make it usable. There were no repeat purchases. The product died within like three months. I mean, it was, but we had part of the information. We didn't have all of the information. And it was because we didn't understand every single step of that buyer's journey because that buyer's journey still had to get them through the assembly of this product for it to be usable. Now, who ever thought I would buy toilet tissue and have to assemble something? Well, apparently people don't want to do that. Now we have what, Cottonelle Fresh Wipes that are exactly like the Huggies Baby Wipe, just for big people. Um, but that's how that came about. But that these are two instances where the Bagel Bites one, any one person could have spent a little more time in that category and that been avoided. And the Cottonelle Fresh, that easily could have been avoided if we just understood the consumer a, li a little more. Um, so that just goes back to what I had on that slide before is that we can't afford to let any detail go unnoticed and product management and marketing both have to be speaking and listening to the market. They both have to understand what's happening out there. Um, then we have this other one that product management focuses on putting product on the shelf and product marketing focuses on getting product off the shelf. To an extent, yes, but again, engaged product manager can be the best messenger for the entire business. And the, the pr product manager really has to have a role in content creation and carrying the message can be critical as we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, another one is product management primarily works with engineering and product marketing primarily works with sales. It, it's very, the passion that comes from the product management team, from what I have seen, there, there's more passion from the people that own the product than there is from the people that market the product. So who do you want to be the face to the consumer? and push and giving, providing the information for the consumer and providing the marketing team with what they need to do what they do best. Um, so that's what we're gonna get into next. We'll get a little bit into working with marketing. So neither product management nor digital marketing can independently exist without the insights and the strategic inputs of, of the other function. Uh, it was different with traditional marketing that was a lot easier. We didn't have messaging changing on the fly. We weren't testing uh, clients in real time. We weren't testing features on a, a SaaS-based product. It was easy. Here's an ad. You approve the ad copy or you fix it and it goes out. Or here's the commercial and you approve the commercial or, or you adjust it and it goes out. Um, but now it's key that the product team understands the marketing priorities and that the marketing team lets the product team understand the necessity of incorporating certain knowledge that they have to, to bring to the marketplace. Um, I, I think it's one of the things, it's one of the big things that a lot of people lose sight of. We sit down as marketers and, you know, I have people on my team that their, their goal is to run Facebook ads. Well, that's great. But if it's a startup and the product is just gaining traction, I'm going to get involved and work with them on the testing of the ads and really getting the, the product owner involved in all of the different features they want to test, what resonates most. Um, it's really that customer enablement really depends on product managers being involved in that process. Um, let's see, next we have is, oh, what the marketing team does. I, I think we all know this, but there's basically three areas that are where the marketing team is delivering value. That's your brand and market awareness, um, managing the demand and sales funnel from the top down, and then the, the execution, um, planning events, planning webinars, trade shows, uh, providing all the materials for that. So that's what we know the marketing team um, 
is doing, but what's the marketing team need? The one common thread of everyone I've ever worked with, physical, application, SaaS-based, the one common thread that marketing needs to perform best is a clear understanding of the vision and the strategy for the company and the product. That is, that's, that, that's critical. Just like I have digital marketing essentialism, there isn't a single person on my team that can talk about digital marketing essentialism with the passion that I, I talk about it when I present it. Every product owner, that vision came from somewhere in somebody's mind and the features came from somebody's mind, but that is the person that is most passionate about that product. Do you, so I, I like it, I liken it to a bride and groom and the joy they have on the day they get married. Try to take that passion and give that same feeling to your marketing team to get to the consumer. You literally have to pass that through them to the end consumer for them to be as effective as possible. So understanding how the marketing team views the vision and the strategy is the most essential component to having a coherent and consistent message going out to the market. Yet we all get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. We get caught up in our roadmap and meeting deadlines and certain numbers. But at the end of the day, the product management team has the passion that the marketing team lacks. And I don't know if, if I've really seen a marketing team that can be the best they can be if the product team doesn't help instill the same passion in the people that are marketing the product. Now, there are products out there that have major social consequences. There are, there are products out there that um, people go work for the company because there's a so social message and there's a passion behind it. Um, I see things like Oculus and Facebook's virtual reality. And I see how passionate those team members get about that product, but not every product is an Oculus. And that's where they're, they're, I see the biggest disconnect between the, the product management team and the marketing team. Um, the, next, the next piece of it, on top of that, that vision and that strategy and really pounding that home, just like any CEO of a company's job is to constantly push the company vision <clears throat> every day, the product manager has to push the product vision every day. And so the, the other piece of it is having accurate product and feature information. There's nothing worse than making a, improving a product. And I see this more in the technology space than I do in the actual physical product space is there are improvements made and there are things are done, there a lot of things are done in a vacuum and the, mar the marketing team never finds out about it uh, until somebody's like, well, yeah, why aren't, you, why, aren't you, why aren't you pushing this? Or we changed that, or that screenshot isn't what it looks like anymore. Well, it would have been nice to know, um, or that feature never made it. So there, there's that piece of it as well. Um, so synergies for success. So these roles differ in many ways, but where they intersect is the critical piece to delivering a successful product and having a successful line of products, a successful brand. Um, most product managers and product marketing managers work in different departments. Um, but they run as a team and working side by side with them to deliver that full product experience is what's needed to exceed the customer and market expectations. Um, and I, I see them both as storytellers. I think that's the biggest takeaway is that product manager is, is a storyteller.
a lot of people talk about, and I think it's very cliche nowadays that marketing is, is all about telling your story. Well, marketer or product managers and, and the visionaries, they're the ones with the best story, but the marketing team can't put it out there if it hasn't been completely pounded into their day to day. Um, the future, I don't think any of us know what the future is going to look like. Um, ideally, it's the, the marketing team and the product team reporting into the exact same executive who can align those two functions from an objective standpoint and make sure that they're, they're working together and in tandem. Um, I think that eventually we'll get to that place. Um, some companies do that now, but it's definitely not the norm. Um, but I, I see that happening. All right, Nate, I tried to keep it short and sweet for you. <laughs> no, that was good. That was really good, Jeff. Thank you. I'm um, exhausted. Well, it's a lot of talking. Now, <laughs> now, normally I like to do like comments and questions all throughout. Um, we didn't do that. So it, anything you guys want to want to chat about? I'm, I'm all for it, except David, we can't let him talk. So I, I, I had a question, Jeff, I'll start, <laughs> I'll start off the questions. <clears throat> you had mentioned testing product ideas through AdWords and um, even using things like Instagram um, as different tools. Like what percentage of like, so obviously I'm sure your customers are doing that. What percent of people like do you see actually using those um, tools to, to to get that 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 feedback? Because it's you know nobody ever thinks of it. Yeah, it's like so like abstract. It's I'm not abstract. It's obvious, but it's off the wall a bit. Um, it's a great <clears throat> idea, depending on the market, of course. So I will sit down. Okay, so let's take a legacy business. Uh, we have a manufacturer, been around for 40 years, um, window fabricators, and we just start working with them. They don't have their messaging nailed down. Well, there's a couple people that have been there forever. The president and CEO is new. They have different messages. Okay, awesome. How are we going to resolve this? Well, neither one is off base, but let's run an ad. And whichever one resonates more and gets a better click, then we know that message is resonating with our target market. Um, and we can run those, the ads can be so pinpointed now to our target market that we can't go wrong in getting in front of the right people. And, but nobody ever thinks of it. I don't know if it's just a little trick that a lot of us, I mean, I've been in this space for, 15 years. I was one of the ones that I would take an article, make every word, have 10 synonyms and have 10,000 links pointing to my site over, you know, within an hour and know how to ping them all and index them all. Maybe it's just something that a lot of us old black hat guys um, who have evolved into the white hat space. I, I, I don't know where I got it from, um, but it's turned out to be invaluable because I live in this digital marketing space where I think that the data is never wrong, especially if you have a, a, a good amount of data and testing messaging, testing product features, testing pain points, benefits. It's all possible. Um, I also believe that all the marketing starts with the words. Um, creative people totally don't agree with that. They think it all starts with how it looks, but believe it or not, the worst looking websites because they have too much text are the ones that convert the best. They don't look great, but they convert. And that's what even Instagram lets us test those messages and those words. Um, we could do it with Facebook. You could do it with Instagram. You can do it with Google ads. You could do it with Bing ads for that matter. But yeah, I don't know where I got it from. Um, it's definitely one of those little secrets that's very effective. And does not cost a ton of money. Some people talk about doing a focus group for messaging. And I'm like, heck, that focus group is going to be 
twelve thousand dollars, we could do that for twelve hundred to three thousand dollars and come up with the same answer. So when you're using like Instagram as an example for this, like are you measuring views? Are you measuring like likes? No, do the polls. Oh, actually poll. ask the question straight out. If you ha could have an option between like a shower or a bigger kitchen in your RV, which would you want? And they can pick shower or bigger kitchen. And we're targeting people that we know are owners. So we, we know that we're going after the people that we want to be in front of. Uh, we're launching a new line of RVs next year. Do you prefer a different version of our current gray or do you prefer a blue? Or so it's all about, and you, I mean, it's easy to do with an application. It's easy to do with a SaaS based platform. Um, you know, what is the most go to CFOs and ask them if you're doing in FinTech, ask them the most important ratio that they look at every, every week, you know, you know, in financial ratios, ask them and they're going to tell you, uh, so when it comes to that Instagram and you're asking the question and they're clicking the answer, it's you're gamifying your customer research or your consumer research. That's so interesting. That's, that's really cool. So Jeff, earlier you mentioned having pixels, Facebook pixels, retargeting, et cetera. Um, I've been noticing recently as I do some of the work with my browsers, both on my website and other places, that sometimes a Facebook pixel doesn't quite get through the security in some yep. cases. And I know that it's getting worse and worse um, from that perspective. Safari, Google, you're seeing more on the iPhone where they're asking more questions before le they're letting people through. And then, of course, the legal issues such as GDPR. How is that changing the way that you're using these pixels and that you're using retargeting? So eventually... Right now, it's not changing it at all. But I am keeping an eye on what's the world gonna look like when these pixels go away. It's not gonna be tomorrow. It's not gonna be 2021. Um, it's probably not gonna be 2022. I think a lot of people thought we were a few years away, but now with COVID, I think all the policy makers and decision makers have too many other things on their plate than to worry about pixels on websites. Um, right now, there is not, the biggest difference we saw was years ago when Google, if you were logged into Google and anything you search, Google does, gives us the not provided for keywords. Now there is a piece of software out there that based on the page you hit first on the website, it can extrapolate what you were looking for at the time. So it actually can fill in the blank on most of those not provided. It's called SEO monitor, but that was the biggest game changer. And be, we haven't seen anything like that ever since. And it, we're still a couple years away from that. Yeah, I understand with the browsers, we still have not seen a big enough impact. I mean, that impact is so minimal. We're not, we're not seeing it yet. So you're saying that Safari 14, for instance, isn't having any kind of significant impact that's even noticeable? Not on the data. Uh-uh. Interesting. Yeah. When, and I will tell you what, when it does start to have a big impact, Search Engine Journal and some of those other larger um, publications are going to be all over it and talking about it. But as of right now, we're just not... It's not, it's not changing how, it's not changing anything for us yet. Anyone else? Questions, comments? So I actually have another question. Um, when you talk about, like I totally am on board with what you're saying. It's like that, that, that product management is, you know, the most one of the most collaborative roles in the company, um, and not just with marketing, right? It's with it's with everyone. Yeah. What what forums? Like this, is something that that I always struggle with because it's like nobody ever wants more meetings, right? <laughs> like, please don't struggle with a meeting. Like, what is what is the most 
one of the most like more effective forms that you've seen for keeping, you know, we'll, we'll just say between the marketing team and the product team, like for keeping everybody in lockstep. So it's not like, oh, a screenshot changed or functionality isn't used. I mean, to your point, like all those, like we all kind of probably smiled a bit because we've all been in those situations where it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. Um, what, what Sweet, do you think thanks. Is the most effective <laughs> forum to, 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 to convey that, the, that the, the, the product message, the product value, the product feature function? So I don't know if there's a right answer, but I will tell you what I have seen and lived through to be the most effective. It was or has been um, to every single Monday morning have a sales, marketing, and product alignment meeting. If nobody has anything to contribute, you decide Friday afternoon you're going to cancel it. But if anybody has a new development, a new insight, or a question, then you say on Friday afternoon, you decide you're going to keep that meeting. And sometimes they're five minutes. Sometimes they could be five hours. Now, they normally aren't, um, but they could be based on the discussion that goes on. So I have found that that's, and you could do it every two weeks, but here's the thing. The discipline has to be that if sales has a question, they say, yeah, cancel the meeting. And then they just ask somebody in marketing. Well, then you don't get to have that discussion across the group. And it's having those discussions across the group. But it, so it's being very disciplined about that meeting being the only place that certain things are discussed so that everybody's in the know and on the same page. Right, right. And it's not like the wishing well meeting where it's like you go there and say, got to have this, got to have that. It's more of what are we hearing? What are we seeing? What's resonating? What isn't? What's coming? like that it's it's more the open discussion versus the do this for me meeting yeah now Just marketing can say we've been way. we've been seeing a few things that we think we need to talk about sales could be like we have some questions that need addressed product um management can say we have a couple we've changed our roadmap or we have a couple new features we think are are worth discussing um but the biggest thing about meetings is being disciplined that the people are sticking to the agenda and not going off and having a, a different conversation. Cause I hate meetings as much as anybody else. I am very, I had an account manager meeting today and somebody asked me about sales and pricing. I was like, this isn't a sales meeting. We do that Mondays. So if you have a question, come to the meeting Monday, but that's not today. Um, but it's just being very disciplined that those, those meetings are taking place and that people are staying in their lane until the, the appropriate time and then when you I mean, like with, with sales or is it sales ops like who because like sales in some companies could be 50 people 100 people no it has to be the leader so you sales, want the leaders and everything right. has to bubble up right you want to make sure that all of those things are bubbling up if it's not bubbling up to to either middle management or above then it's probably not worth the the discussion's not there yet so, but you keep it focused on the, like, you know, in a company where there's three products, you keep it focused on the product, but. Or, or the, the marketing. I yeah. mean, it, it's, it can, can be any of the three areas, but if you want to force that collaboration, those alignment meetings are the best way I've seen to force that collaboration. Yeah. Makes sense. The kicker is canceling them and not have everybody show up and say, well, I don't have anything. And everyone else say, I don't have anything. And then you're all like, well, that was dumb. And then before you know it, you're talking about the weekend a half hour later. That's a good point. That's really good. Yeah, you just have, to, just you have to be disciplined to cancel it on Friday. Just get everybody's feedback and cancel it if there's nothing to cover. We just had Leslie on the chat chime in with some of her own experience. Leslie, would you want to explain that to the group? Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Had to find my mute button. Um, so in, I've worked in um, 
with CPG companies, for example, PPG would be one local one. And the product manager, which in that case of PPG, I was in that role, that was kind of the uh, key communicator facilitator. And I would bring together in weekly or bi-weekly meetings, product management, brand management, which would be the marketing side and key account sales. And we'd have our discussions just like um, Jeff recommended. Separately, there'd be product management, R&D or technology or development and operations manufacturing in this case. So now that I know what uh, are the issues, discussions and um, plans related to sales and marketing, I can now communicate that to development, the technical side. So that's kind of, and we did those weekly, biweekly, uh, or and or monthly on any given new product uh, development project, launch planning pro project, et cetera. So just an example of what uh, Jeff yeah, is no, recommending. No, and that's literally as the product manager, you're seeing some reading your, your message there. The brand manager and key account salespeople aren't the right people to be in the room with R&D and operations. And you're usually talking about such an array of personalities that that product manager has to be a great communicator to be able to work with the, the brand manager and the sales team and the R&D operations, engineering, what have you. But yeah, that's, and that's a great way to go about it. Excellent. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, another question on the chat here from Dennis, who asks, uh, how do you instill, maintain, or increase that passion? Uh, I don't know, Dennis, if you want to clarify, but it sounds like, Jeff, what you were talking about earlier with, with having and then transmitting that passion to the product marketing group, maybe. Yeah, so I, probably a lot of people here could, could answer that, but I think there's a big difference between a business run by an entrepreneur and a Fortune 500 business. Um, a lot of times a business run by the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur has something to do with the product. Um, and it's, it's their livelihood, it's their baby. The business was created around this and they're the ones out there pushing that passion out to the entire team. And literally the role of a, a CEO in that organization or look at the product manager as the CEO of the product team um, is to constantly reinforce why we do what we do and, and, and bring that passion to the table. So it, in my mind, it's being a leader within your team, but what, the leaders can't always be caught up in the tactical. They have to be constantly reinforcing the message, the vision and the why behind it. Um, this, every product was created for a reason. Somebody thought that there was a better way or it met a need and it was the, it was, you know, the best thing out there. Somebody has that passion. Somebody believes it fully and somebody is responsible for bringing that to the team every single day. Um, it's, it's, it's just part of that. It's thinking like a leader even if you are not in a leadership position. Um, I, don't, I don't know how else to explain it. Does that answer the question, Dennis? Yeah, thank you. Okay, sure. I mean, to your point, a startup versus like something that's in the middle versus something like a top, you know, 500 company. Um, that's, it's sometimes very, you have to go through a lot of uh, introspective, I think, in order to get to that point. But yeah. I yeah, agree. I mean, how many people in a, in a Fortune 500 company are just going through the motions? They're there because that job paid more than when they were down the street. And it doesn't matter to them what the product is, but somebody has to reinforce to them why that product is the best product out there 
or why that product is making a difference in somebody's life or some business's day-to-day execution. And the more whoever picks up that ball and runs with it, um, keeps it in the forefront, the team's either going to buy into it or people are going to weed themselves out and leave. Um, and it's not easy. You're right. There is some introspection there for being that person that leads the charge. But a lot of times a product manager, they're passionate about this. The marketer isn't always passionate about it. And that pro- it's up to that product manager to instill that passion. But you're right. It's not, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, being a product manager is not easy. <laughs> on top of that mind if i add on to that that um response because as you know that i have had a lot of of background in this type of thing related to my dale carnegie stuff that i've been doing but i think one of the things you need to think about is that very often when people go into positions like this they have not really had the mindset change that is from the guy who's responsible for listening to the guy above him and doing what's been what they're supposed to do this is the person who needs to be the leader be the change agent make things happen and until they're willing to instill that in themselves or until they recognize that they need to instill that in in themselves the the product manager job is harder and they are less likely to assume the role yeah i i think even what you're saying gets to that whole it starts at the top yeah And that's where that came from is if leadership isn't passionate about what the company is doing, it's very hard for the people down the ladder to be passionate about what the company is doing. So first class teams are teams that have leadership that is passionate and they instill that throughout the organization, which you find that's why people like Jack Welch and Tim Cook and Um, Steve Jobs, those guys were, they instilled that passion throughout their teams. And that's key. You're, if if you're not doing that, uh, if the leadership isn't doing that, it's very, it's hard for anyone in the team to do that. Agreed. Agreed. But then to your point of being a product manager, then you're held to the fire for your PNL. So, Hey. (laughs) Yeah. um, But sometimes it, it's, it takes it takes that one person to be the spark for everybody else. I mean, I think that I have seen what you're talking about is um, not having the passion, not instilling the passion in the team. I think I have seen that more in family-run businesses than I've seen in any other business I've worked with. Um, I don't know why, but it, I think that the family run businesses that I've worked with have a much harder time at pushing that message down from the top. Um, I, I know that the, the, the big fortune 500 fortune 100 companies, they try hard. Uh, there's some really good leaders there, but they have to have the right people under them to, to pass that down through the organization. I will say that's probably one of the reasons why I'm not in corporate America. I mean, it's probably the answer you don't want, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've, I've, I've experienced it where, yeah, they've, um, we, we bought a startup, loved it. They, they did a great, I, they, they were incorporated into the organization. And then after their three years, they left. So, and yeah, yeah that was, tip, that's typical because of, like I think what you experience, what you explained is it's it's hard, but at the same time, there's that freedom, there's that passion that's that's with within there, and um, that's that's uh, to that point. How, I guess my question was, how do you then take that, put it in a bottle, give it to the marketing team, give it to the sales team, give it to, actually the sales team's more passionate than anybody else. Cause they're, they're the ones that are, you know, yeah, you gotta make the numbers. So. And I, the, the only way to do that is through constant reinforcement, 
constantly talking about the vision and tying everything that everybody does back to the vision. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and I, I've, I'm living through it now since I, re, since I came up with digital marketing essentialism and I've, I've figured out what our why is as an organization. I'm, the team is, is starting to buy into it and starting to live it as much as I've, because I, I haven't stopped talking about it. Um, we, we're there for one reason and one reason only, and that is to help somebody's business grow. We have, we have companies, they're fairly large companies, but there might be one or two owners at the top. And I know that that guy sleeps better knowing that he is, has passed his marketing off to us, whether they have a marketing team or not. If we're helping to oversee those efforts and we're running it, they've, they've put that trust in us and it, it's up to us to lose that trust. And that guy sleeps better at night because they feel like they've made a great decision. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting that through the team, through to the team. Like there, there are people that through, even through COVID, there are businesses that we helped work with that that who knows if we weren't as forgiving on receivables and stuff, would they have made it or not? But these guys actually rely on us to generate revenue and make a difference in their business. And everybody's product is created to make a difference in somebody's life, some way, somehow. Um, and if you can figure out what that is and get everybody else to hang their hat on it, that's that's where it comes from but you can never stop talking about it everything we do has to tie back to we are hired to get results for this team and they are relying on us to perform and if we don't perform that business could be in jeopardy and i hammer that home and it, it took me i mean i've owned this business for three years it took me probably it was last august when I came to the revelation of what I needed to do to get the team to be as passionate as I am about what we do every day. And it's been a little over a year and they're really starting to, to, to buy in and to, to really understand what that vision is and, and live it with me. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, Jeff, like I, <clears throat> and everyone, like I've experienced this too. I worked for a large, medical device manufacturer here in Pittsburgh and people get, you know, complacent by, because of the regulations and it's so highly regulated and things move slow. They, 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 they lose sight of why you're there. Like what the difference that the product or in your situation, Jeff, the service actually creates, like what's the value that we're creating and <clears throat> delays matter. Because you know whether it's whether it's in the medical device world where people aren't getting the care they need, or in Jeff's business where people aren't getting the business they need to keep their businesses afloat, like the like the why that people lose sight of the why you're really here, and they can't see the forest through the trees. And so it's always that like you have to be that evangelist to remind them it's not about the widget, it's about what the widget creates the bigger picture. And that's, it's that yeah. to point. It's that constant reinforcement because people lose sight of it. Cause you get, you get so buried in your day to day that you forget the big picture. And I think it's that, that constant reminder. Is what, is well, what nowadays happens. you're, you're a teacher, you're a, <laughs> with your kids and right. it's even harder to, to keep that in focus. Um, I, it looks like Andy left. He had asked a, or Randy left. He had asked a question early on. I didn't see that one, but I don't think he's on anymore, is he? Uh, uh, no. See, we didn't answer his question early, and then he, just, he bounced. Yep. So we're not going to answer that question, then. <laughs> yeah, forget it. Well, I, I'm not sure if, if what he what he what he meant either. Um. So that question needs to be framed. Yeah. What's What's the context? Right. I think he was weighing in when you were talking about a couple of the product challenges of Bagelbytes and Cottonelle Fresh. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Hey, Jeff, I had a question about data. Um, you know, any, 
any thoughts or tips um, you have for you know me as a product manager working with marketing teams um, you know around how how to get them to think more in terms of data and provide that kind of data feedback loop back to the product team it's um you know, a little bit of a challenge where I'm coming from, you know, just getting them to think more in terms of, of data and providing that feedback on what they're seeing. Um, you know, great group, very creative, but um, in terms of numbers, it's it's a bit of a struggle. So any any thoughts there around? Um, what space are you in? What industry? Uh, financial services software. Oh, I've been in that space. Um, so wait a minute. So the marketing team isn't there. It, like, are they not living, breathing data all day, every day? There's it, it, part of a disconnect between getting that back to the product team, but it's it's not, no, it's not living, breathing data um, whatsoever. And you had mentioned they're great creatively. Is the marketing team a bunch of creatives? Um. Yes, for the most part. Yeah. So is it I'm thinking like, is that something where I'm saying like, hey, just, you know, give me the raw data, send that over. Like, what are some baby steps to kind of Well, do they even that? have the That's data is the question. Um, I I think they I think they do. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a great starting point. I agree with you. I think they do. It's just not interpreted or shared, I think, as well as it could be. So it's like, how can I kind of tee that up and just get them thinking more in that manner? And are they so in that financial services is it a SaaS based product yeah and you, you don't get any data on or insight into how the users are using the product no i'm i'm thinking more in terms of you know interactions with our you know web-based marketing or outbound yeah. marketing um so we we do have the product to user interaction feedback but it's it's the marketing data um, you know, that I'd love to get my hands on a little bit more. So, A, they should have Google Analytics set up and they should have Google Search Console, which just got changed. I forget what they're calling it now. Um, they And they should have Bing Analytics set up on there. Those are going to be the ones, the, the Google ones are going to be the ones that you can use most proactively from a product standpoint, and literally in five to six hours, you can go online and take the Google Analytics certification course. I, so as a, a marketing agency, we require every single person on our team to be certified in Google Ads and Google Analytics. And I will tell you, Google Ads, the only reason I require certification is because Google ads is not a big part of our business, but it forces you to understand how the consumer thinks. <clears throat> and it's one of the best marketing trainings out there. Um, as far as putting yourself in the shoes of the consumer, uh, but you can literally knock out that Google analytics. It's about five to six hours and go through that course it's free and they should give you access to google analytics bing analytics and google search console and you will be able to then start to look at the data and if you if, if you want to hit me up offline um we can talk more about that if you need help with anything i i can help you out um but that's going to be where you start getting access to google analytics will be key for understanding what's happening on their end. Now, there's this whole other thing where if they're not doing a great job and you can see it in the data, you're a threat now. Um, so, so starting, I mean, this is where you get into that uh, product management versus marketing versus sales and how do they all get along? Uh, but you're probably better off if you don't have that data geek on your team that is constantly sifting through it because those are the ones that are most protective over the data. Um, so, so 
but that's you want to get access to the Google Analytics. Now, what we do as an organization, we have one, we have digital at redshiftdm.com. All of our Google is set up through that one email address so that we can have access to all of our clients. You might, there might be an internal address that's tied to that, or they have to give you access. Um, that's the place to start. Yeah, that, that's helpful. I, I, I think, you know, the product team is much more comfortable with data and sifting through it. So, you know, it might be something that we just take on and, and get, get that access kind of the baby steps. So that's, that's cool. Thank you. I mean, the, the data you get out of, I mean, Google Analytics has millions of data points. So what you're going to get out of that could be invaluable. Um, and especially if your marketing team is not um, as effective as they could be, you might be able to fill in those gaps with the insights. But nowadays, the data tells the, I mean, it, it's been this way um, for a while, but the data tells the story. You can't argue the data. The data, I mean, it, it gives us the big picture. So, um, when it comes to that part of it, a lot of what you want to look at is where are people spending time on the website? What topics are they reading about if you have a blog? What um, pages are they spending more time on? Because when you start to engage them and they're spending more time on certain areas of the site, that could tell you that you have an issue or that's the most favorable part of what you have to offer. Um, and you can start to test those things. Uh, to figure out, you know, if they're hanging out on this certain page, well, you can really start to get into the why behind that. Um, but yeah, feel free to to reach out um, at any time. All right, everybody. Any any other questions before we sign off for the night? Going once, look at auctioneer. Going twice. <laughs> Good to see you all. So absolutely I'm here. Thanks for joining everyone. Uh, I think we were talking at the top of the meeting. We'll we'll take this recording and get it up on our YouTube channel uh, and post that in the LinkedIn group. I think we did that last time. A little bit easier for everyone. So stay tuned for that. And as always, thanks for joining everyone. Yes, awesome. Yeah, I hope it was I hope it was helpful. Um, if you guys have want more of a deep dive in the marketing side of things. Uh, I'm glad to come back uh, and, and get into that. I, I under I know just from doing a lot of speaking engagements, the values in the Q and A. Um, I mean, Nate, if you want to do and ask me anything, one, uh, you know, at some point, uh, we could even do that. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. We've done uh, sort of like lightning speakers. I wonder if we could do a lightning ask me anything with a couple of panelists. Anyway, that's our idea. Cool. Awesome. That's a great idea. I'm starting to research some tools in the space. I'd be curious if uh, what you guys are using for different things and if you've got a list going anywhere. Just um, to test some stuff out. Oh, man. All right. I'm an early adopter. I test everything. Yeah, I, mean, I, am, <laughs> I am the king of I'll have 12 software platform charges on the company card this month. And then I cancel them all next month because they sucked, but I try them all. Uh, it drives our bookkeeper absolutely insane. Um, do you have, do you have certain things you're looking at right now? Um, I'm looking at stuff like, uh, stuff like AHA those types I, of things let's see i am so are you looking more from from a marketing or no which... from a product standpoint not not from marketing okay all right so believe it or not i was just looking at aha myself um what was the other one so aha was one i was looking at gantt pro is one that i think is great for planning purposes um, those are the only two that actually come to mind right now. And yeah, I kind of want to stay away from Gantt charts. No offense. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm more in the agile space, but anyway, I mean, just for something, just throwing that out there, just 
Yeah, and are you talking of... more in that project for project management and planning? Uh, some of it, some of it for prioritization, but you know, even data tools, uh, different different measurements. Um, you know, I yeah. do more. Mm, I don't know if it's really more internal, but I'll, it tends to be more like B two B type of yeah. product. Um, and sometimes the analytics aren't really as straightforward. Like I, I have a, a chart of value. <laughs> call okay. It. It's yeah, kind yeah. of the value of doom, which all the, you know, different things on it to measure by. And I was just curious. I mean, it's probably for a discussion another time or something, but if someone has a list, I would sure appreciate just any, anything new that I haven't checked out before. Oh, yeah. Thing Adrian, what do you what's your last name? Lala. And that might be a good question for the LinkedIn group, actually, Adrienne, if you wanted to join that. Um, oh, sorry? If you wanted to join the LinkedIn group we have at producttankpittsburgh.com, that would be a great place to ask the question. Yeah, I think I might be already a member, okay. but I'll check. I think yeah, and I'll, I'll reach out to you on LinkedIn also. Here's my, uh, I'll post my stuff. Anyway. Great. Got it. Yeah, great conversation. This is a really good one. All right, everyone. Yeah, that was fun. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Jeff. All right, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, and I will talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thanks. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good night. All right, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.